Good morning. Happy Holy Wednesday. This is Mark Driscoll from Oakdale Free Methodist Church here uh, in my house here at South Fork in, uh, in Jackson, Kentucky. Glad that you're here with us today. It is the 13th of April. This is Holy Wednesday of Holy Week. Uh, every day this week we're looking at uh, what happened in that final Passion Week of Jesus' uh, life on earth before his resurrection. Um, and we see on this Wednesday, this was a day when a lot of stuff was going on. Um, and I summarize it in this way. There was plotting, there was pouring, and there was preparing. And those are, you know how preachers are. We want everything to start with the same letter all the time. Anyway, um, uh, so it is easy to remember, admit it. Um, plotting, pouring, preparing. We're going to talk today about how the, there were so many things beginning, the storm clouds, are pretty much gathering over Jesus at this point. This is where we've gone from people being a little bit upset to people actually plotting to have him killed. This is this is beyond the uh, theoretical, what are we going to do about this guy, to this guy needs to die. And this is, where, this is the decision that is made on Wednesday, and they begin setting things in motion. But other things are being set in motion at the same time. And so, you know, uh, let's pray, because I've got a lot I want to say. Can you pray with me? Jesus, uh, I want to make sure that I say what you want me to say. There's so many things uh, that, that this text gives us, and there's so many things we could, could say. But, Lord, I know you have a word for this hour. You have, you have something that you want to communicate uh, to me and uh, to e each of my hearers in this hour. And so, Lord, help me uh, today. Help us to hear your word. Help us to respond to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, let me just kind of give you the overview of what's going on here. Jesus has been, uh, he's, he's ridden into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Uh, he has flipped over the tables. He has cleared the temple, cursed the fig tree. He has pronounced judgment on the, on the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious system. Uh, really on the nation, and he has, he, has, uh, he has set things in motion, and people are becoming very angry with Jesus, and uh, the religious authorities in particular. Um, <coughs> and so things are being, made, being getting set into motion. And at the same time, God's plan is being set into motion. And, uh, you know, a lot of times we're aware of what the enemy is doing. We see the devil trying to make things happen, and we're, we're so conscious of what the enemy is doing, we forget that the way even behind the scenes of all that, God has his own plan in motion. God, God is sovereign over everything. Uh, you, you don't catch God off guard. And when you, when you see uh, Judas making plans and the, the, the leaders making plans and all these people doing all this kind of stuff, and you see that but God's in control. He's got it going on. And so when we look at the nations around us and the world around us, we're aware of uh, political machinery that's active. And we know that there are uh, cr things happening in, 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 the, in society that, uh, that uh, baffle us. And, and we feel like people, you know, people aren't being straight with us. And, we, and, and there's a lot of hidden things. And, and we just kind of wonder where's the future going and, and, and who's really telling us the truth. And, but you know what? God is over all of that. There, you, don't, you don't get anything over on God. He's got it all under control. And so whatever is happening in Washington or in the UN or in the, in the you know, social media or Disney World or all these crazy things happening around us, you know what? God is over all of it. And he's got his plan for his kingdom and his glory. And, and he's going he's gonna to win in the end. And so sometimes when we're trying to sort out all the nonsense around us, just remember this. God's got it figured out. He's over it. He's got it. And he's going to work it out. Work it out for his glory and his purpose. And for those who trust in him, that's fantastic news. Now let me read you this story out of Matthew 26. And we see three things going on. We see plotting, pouring, preparing. We see these things engaged in, the, in this place as we move closer to the cross. Listen to these, these verses. Starting in verse 1, it says, When Jesus had finished all the sayings, he said to his disciples, <clears throat> You know that after two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests and elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest 
whose name was Caiaphas, and they plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Now, when Jesus was at Bethany, now this is a... Uh, this story is backing up to the Saturday before, but Matthew places it thematically in this section because uh, it fits in with what's going on, even though what happened at Bethany actually happened a couple days earlier. All right, so you got that. All right, and so Matthew just, he kind of like flashes back to Bethany. Listen to this. Now, when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head and as he reclined at table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could, could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you'll not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment he sought an opportunity to betray him. Now on the first day of the unleavened bread... The disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I'll keep Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. So now we're entering in to a seven-day period of feasting called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's seven days. And it kicks off with the, the Passover feast, which is the first of those feasts. And then for the next seven days, uh, they're having this unleavened bread uh, as a celebration of, of the whole Passover deal. right? So this is kind of a season of feasting that they're entering into. Now, what's going on here? Um, first of all, uh, Jesus is over everything. If you notice the first couple of verses, it says, When Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to be crucified. You see, you see all this plotting that's already happening, but Jesus is already ahead of it. He's already ahead of the game. And, and that's an important thought. That's an important understanding because whatever the devil is plotting, whatever the devil is trying to, to manifest, Jesus is already a step ahead of the game. And it may be right now in your life, you've got some deals going on, and you've got some things where you can see uh, the framework of, of the devil trying to, to build some nonsense into your life. He's trying to undermine your family, or he's trying to tear away at your ministry, or he's trying to defeat your confidence, or he's trying to lure you into something. And he, he's just got all this, uh, this uh, scaffolding going on that he's building up. But you understand that just like Jesus here, Matthew 26, 1 and 2, Jesus already knew what was going down. He wasn't surprised by this. This didn't catch him off guard. And people often talk about Jesus like he, he didn't know what was happening. Are you kidding me? He was way ahead of the game. Uh, he knew this was coming. It was the reason he came. He came to die. He didn't come to be a humanitarian. He didn't come just to be a nice person or to, to just to give us teachings. He came to die. And he knew it was coming. But he was he had already overcome it before he even got to it. And so and I want you to know that right off the bat, that whatever's happening with you, whatever kind of deal you're dealing with, whatever uncertainty there is, whatever the enemy's trying to bring into your life, uh, get focused on Jesus. Don't get focused on the devil. Get focused on Jesus because he's ahead of the game. He's got it. He's already ahead of it. And so you just rest in him. But but let's watch what happens next. It says, now here's the plotting. It says, the chief priests and elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. They said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. They knew if they, they just went out in public and grabbed him, that there would be a riot in the streets, right? So they didn't want to do that. They needed a secret way to get Jesus away from the crowds. If you read in John's account, 
Caiaphas says, don't you people know how important it is for one man to die for all the people? They had this, the conversation is, and Caiaphas doesn't even realize that he's prophesying about the death of Jesus. He's saying, look, it's better for us to kill, let, let them kill one than to kill all of us, right? Because they were afraid Rome was going to crack down on this whole thing, right? And so they said, let's just get, let's get a scapegoat. Let's get him, get him killed and they'll leave us alone. He didn't realize that's exactly what the plan was. But they're plotting. The other thing that I want you to notice is uh, that I'm going to skip down and then we're going to go back. We're going to skip down to Judas part in the plot. Verse 14 it says, And then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What do you give me if I deliver him to you? Now if you notice, they didn't come and say, Hey, we're offering you money if you'll get, do this. He, he came to them. He, he was looking for a chance to betray Jesus. He wanted out, which shows us he never really believed in the first place. And uh, so Judas is involved. You know, there's a lot of people that are associated with Jesus, but they don't really believe in him. They don't really trust him. And they don't really buy in with who he is. And so when it comes time to make a decision, they back out and they quit. This is what Judas did. And Judas said, how much you give me? You know, Judas was kind of into the money. He was the treasurer for the disciples. He used to help himself and steal some of the money. And he's kind of, he's into that. And the Pharisees, they love money. And so these guys were, they're, they're a great team because they all love money. And, uh, but the thing is, is that they agreed to 30 pieces of silver. Now, what you may not know is that 30 pieces of silver wasn't really a whole lot. It might sound like a lot to you and me, but it really wasn't that much in the scheme of things. It was kind of, it was the same amount, 30 pieces of silver in the book of Exodus was the amount you would pay, let's say if you are you had a slave that got killed by, by an ox, there was a there was a rule that said you had to pay, pay him 30 shekels uh, to pay for that, that, that dead slave. <clears throat> it was just kind of a, a band-aid to cover up a, a terrible event and slaves weren't considered that important they were just kind of property you know oh, well you know give them 30 pieces of silver uh take care of it and they can get another slave and so it's kind of a slave price right and so you've got jesus being sold out for nothing i mean but that shows that the, neither the priests nor judas thought very highly of jesus uh, he Judas, if he thought more about it, he could have demanded more, and they would have had it. They would have paid it. But you see, uh, nobody really thought that much of Jesus. And here's here's an interesting thing. Let's talk about uh, the economics here, because right in this in the next story, you have a woman coming and she's pouring out. She comes and she she takes this most expensive thing she has. She wants to honor Jesus. She's preparing him for his burial. She may be the only person in the room who gets what's going on. And she pours out this expensive perfume on his head. And what did the disciples say? Well, particularly it was Judas that voiced this in other Gospels. He says, why this waste? Couldn't we have used that money to help the poor? Like Judas really cares about the poor. And Jesus, you know, he said, look, uh, you leave her alone because what she has done is beautiful. In fact, wherever the gospels preach, I'm never going to forget this. This will be talked about everywhere and uh, because it really is something beautiful to him. Now, so here's what's sad to me. Here's what's really sad about the economics here. First of all, the, neither the priests nor Judas thought Jesus was worth a whole lot when it came time to buy a price to betray him. And then even, even in the, the disciples, uh, when this woman pours out, they consider that a waste. Are you kidding me? Their king, their rabbi, the one who has given his life for them for the last three years, and they don't think that he's worth that kind of an of extravagance. Well, at least we, uh, in other gospels, it says it was Judas who said this. Here it just generalizes. It says all the disciples, but we assume it was probably Judas. So here again, you see Judas. For Judas, Jesus just isn't worth that much. He's not worth the extravagance. He's not worth the worship. And he's certainly not worth more than a few shekels, a few silver shekels to have him taken out. He's just kind of a nuisance. You know, uh, so we've got these guys who are plotting, and they, they, to them, Jesus is just a problem to be solved. He is just something that's in the way to be gotten out of the way. But then you have this woman who's pouring out everything she's got. Uh, and, and she's being awkward. She doesn't know what she's doing. She she makes a mess of things. She's embarrassed, embarrassing everybody else. It's uncomfortable. She's wiping her his feet with her hair, crying all over him, just making a total mess. 
in her attempt to just love him and say, I, I just don't even know how to love you. Let me just do what I can. And she's, for her, no price is too high. And she will, she will do anything. And that is so beautiful to Jesus. And he, he doesn't say, oh, get away from me. Why are you making this mess? He says, I'm never going to forget this. I will never forget what you've done. Now, there's a third thing that's happening in this same story. Later on, down in verse 17 to 19, the disciples come to Jesus and um, they said, where do you want to prepare the Passover? You know, the Passover's coming up and uh, so they want to get ready, right? You've got to get all the stuff set up and everything like that. And so uh, the city is crowded because everybody's there for Passover. It's a big stinking deal, right? And so they've got all this going on. And... Um, so the disciples come to Jesus, hey, hey, where do you want to set it, where do you want us to set it up? And so Jesus tells them, he says, all right, you're going to go find a man and he's going to tell you, you go, go tell him it's time. I've already made arrangements. Isn't it interesting when Jesus told them to go do something, he had already arranged for everything to be taken care of. Isn't that great news to know, just as a side note, that when Jesus calls us to do something, he's already made arrangements. He's already got the future taken care of. You may be dealing with this, but here's the thing that, uh, that they were preparing. Uh, so we've got the, the plotting, we've got the pouring, and we've got the preparing. Now what they were doing was simple obedience. These disciples really were kind of confused. They knew that Jesus kept talking all this talk about being dead and turned over to the, to the authorities and, and all this stuff was going to happen. And, and they were kind of like freaking out. Like, Jesus, what are you talking about? What, what's going to happen here? Um, he hasn't had the Last Supper yet. He hasn't sat down and really shown it to him yet. But but they just know they're going to, okay, we're going to have Passover. And then what? Are they gonna, somebody going to kill you? Somebody's going to try to take you out? What, what's, the, what's going on here, right? And uh, so they're just not certain about the future. And they're not sure how things are going to pan out. But all they know is their Lord has asked them to do something, and they're going to do it. They're making preparation for a future they're not so sure of that they know their Lord has commanded them to go and take care of things. And so they say, okay, if he says, you know, uh, when we rode into Jerusalem, he told us where the donkey would be, it was there. Then we went and picked it up and we brought it in. That worked out. Now he's telling us, go to a room and you're going to meet a man and he's going to lead you to the upper room. Hey, we're going to trust him. And they're just trusting Jesus, even though they're not sure of the details. They don't know the future. All they know is we're going to prepare what our master has called us to prepare. We're going to take the steps of obedience, even though we're not totally sure of what the implications are. We're not sure. You know, there are things that God calls us to do. And see, these guys, as they were preparing the Passover, as far as they knew, it was just another Passover. I mean, I, they knew things were weird, but they didn't know it was going to be the Last Supper. They didn't know that there was going to be this crucifixion and death, even though Jesus had told them three times. They weren't really computing. It wasn't making sense. I wouldn't have known either. I, I would have been totally lost. And so, uh, you know, Jesus just says, okay, guys, look, I know you don't get it. I know you don't understand. Look, just go set things up. Set up the room. I'll take care of the rest. Just, just do what I ask. I got it. And so what we've got here, we've got three responses to Jesus on this day. We've got some who are plotting to get him out of the way because their own agenda is so important that Jesus is just a problem. He's just something to be gotten rid of. Uh, there are those in our culture today who are plotting. Uh, in our world today, there are those who their plot is to get rid of this Jesus. Whether it's a government that's persecuting the church and saying, we've got to get these Christians out of here. Or whether it's uh, legislation that, that pushes at the very fabric of, of who we are as a church and, and calls us to either compromise or be, or be persecuted. Uh, or it's just societal pressure where people are saying, you know, we've got to get the, you know, we don't want to talk about God and faith and stuff in school. We'd rather talk about gender assignments and, and help have, tell little preschoolers how to choose their own gender. We don't want to tell anybody about faith and love and hope. We want to, you know, it's kind of insane. And so we, let's edge this whole Jesus thing out of here. Even with this celebration, there are people who are just kind of annoyed 
at this whole Easter thing. It's well, let's just it's bunnies and candy. Let's don't don't bother with the Jesus thing. Um, and, and so and people want to sideline faith. And so there's that plotting to get rid of him. For many people, he is a nuisance. And unfortunately, even for many Christians, Jesus is just let's just people want to get saved from God. You know, some people want to get saved from God. And what I mean by that is that the only reason they got saved was to get God off their back. It was like, I, I, okay, let me just deal with it. Let me pray the prayer and get baptized and do my church thing so that I can get my ticket to heaven and I don't have to worry about God anymore. And I can just go on about my business. And they don't realize that they're totally missing the gospel altogether. Uh, going through religious motions will not give you eternal life. Um, no matter no matter what you do or what church you go to, just going through the motions ain't going to get you to heaven. What gets you to heaven is dying to yourself and putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, repenting of your true repentance of sin and truly believing in him, not just going through the motions. There are people today who are just plotting. They're trying to get Jesus out of their way so they can go on about their business. And uh, so they can just kind of, let's, let's get the God thing out of the way. So I, some people do that with their morning devotions. Let me, I, you know, I'm a Christian. i got to have my devotions or I'm not a good Christian. So here, let me read my Bible. Let me say my prayer. All right, I'm done now. Let's get that out of the way because i got things to do. I've got places to go. i got people to see. Um, hurry up and get that prayer over with, preacher. i got to get to lunch. You know what I'm saying. It's, it's this attitude of plotting where Jesus isn't really worth a whole lot. The 30 shekels is just like, ah, eh, whatever. You know, um, some of us have a 30 shekel attitude toward Jesus. It's like he's not really worth much to us. And yet we have, on the other hand, we have those who want to pour. We have that woman who is so aware of her need. She's so aware of his love and his majesty and his beauty. She has discovered who this Jesus is. And she does not care what other people think. She's not worried about the judgmental looks of those others who are in that room. She's not even worried about how awkward it looks. She just wants to give the Lord Jesus the love he deserves. She wants to pour out on him because she sees him as the king. And my prayer is that I will see him that way. My prayer is that I won't plot to get him out of my way, but that I will pour out because I realize who he is. Have you come to realize who he is today? Have you realized that Jesus is not just some figure from history? He's not just some voice of morality. He's not just some mascot for your political project. He is the Son of God. He is the true Lamb of God who was sacrificed for the sins of the world. He, he, do you realize who He is? If you do, you'll pour out everything you got for Him. And so, and then there, there's the the third is the preparers. You know, they're just obeying the Lord Jesus. They they love Him, they're committed to Him, and they don't always know what the future holds, but they know who holds the future. And so they're gonna. If He says set up the tables, I'm gonna set tables. If He says reserve the room for the upper room, I'm gonna. You know, whatever He calls me to do, I'm gonna do it. That's the preparers. They're preparing for him to do what he is going to do in the world. Are you preparing for him today? You know, what we should, what should we be preparing for? We should be preparing for his return. He's coming again. Jesus, on the Tuesday of Holy Week, explained that he's coming, and we don't know the day or the hour, but one day this king who died for us and rose from the dead, he's going to come back. The angels said to the apostles, why do you look up into heaven? The same Jesus who, who has gone up is going to come down in exactly the same way he went up. And so get out there and start preparing, preparing for him to come. As you're preparing for this Easter celebration, prepare for your king. Because there's what if you celebrate Easter in glory this year? What if you end up celebrating in heaven this year? It could happen. You could be, the you could be there. You could be seated with him this next Easter celebration. If not, um, you're here and you're preparing for that day when he comes again. Are you prepared for him? Are you preparing for the Lord Jesus Christ? I want to ask you, uh, how, do, how do you prepare? First thing you do is you realize that you need him and you, tr and you repent of your sins. You know, our sins do separate us from God. But God has made a way through his son for our sins to be forgiven and for us to to uh, escape judgment, escape the righteous judgment we deserve and to find eternal life through the forgiveness of sins. 
and when I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and I trust that his death on the cross paid the full penalty for all of my sin then I can become a child of God by putting my faith in him and committing myself to him and becoming his disciple will you trust in him today listen today I know that sometimes I'm plotting when I when G, when I'm more interested in my own agenda I'll start plotting to get him out of my way sometimes I'm boring sometimes I'm aware of his majesty and his beauty and I just want to love him and sometimes it's awkward and sometimes I don't know what I'm doing but I just give him my love even though it's gonna be messy even though I'm not sure how to do it and he receives it he says he never forgets it or sometimes I'm just spending my life preparing I'm just getting ready for him and I'm doing whatever he calls me to do and I'm walking with him today what are you doing are you plotting are you pouring or are you preparing the great news is the same wonderful Savior is the same loving compassionate faithful Savior to whoever will trust in him whether wherever you find yourself today the great news is you can turn to him right now and give everything you got to him will you trust him today will you walk with him God bless you go in peace